Okay, so if you haven't figured it out yet, our theme today is like cosmic origins and creation, right? We didn't say that earlier. And so I want to talk about the understanding the Christian doctrine of creation. And thankfully, both Karen and Steve did a wonderful job of getting us oriented to thinking about those or this particular topic. And Steve in particular shared some beautiful passages, as, as did Karen, from Scripture, right? From the Catechism of the Catholic Church. And so I want to add to that by sharing with you a cosmological statement that captivated me at a very early age, in fact, when I was 16 years old. Um, <clears throat> and some of you may actually know this. So if you do, you can raise your hands. How many of you have heard these words before? In the beginning, the universe was created. This has made a lot of people very angry, and it's been widely regarded as a bad move. You ever heard those words? How many of you have heard those words before? All right, what's that from? Anybody? The Hitchhiker's Guide to the, the second book of Douglas Adams, Hitchhiker's Guide to the Galaxy, right? Um, the book called The Restaurant at the End of the Universe, which was a sci-fi comic classic from the late 70s, early 80s, and a favorite of my late adolescence. I loved those books. At the time, I was in pretty complete rebellion from the Catholic faith of my upbringing. And in the sentence immediately following this one, the first sentence of the book, I found what I thought was a wonderful indictment of what I had been taught about the doctrine that God is the creator of all things. So Adams continues. Many races believe that the universe was created by some sort of God. Though the Jatravartid people of Vitvoto VI believe that the entire universe was in fact sneezed out of a being called the Great Green Arkel Seizure. The Jatravartids who live in perpetual fear of the time they call the coming of the great white handkerchief <laughs> are small blue creatures with more than 50 arms each, who are therefore unique in being the only race in history to have invented the aerosol deodorant before the wheel. So anyway, to my mind back then, what I thought Christians believed about creation seemed just as fantastic and ridiculous as the Jatravartid theological cosmology. Of course, I had a, an extremely superficial understanding of the biblical doctrine of creation, right? Of what and how we can read the Genesis accounts, for instance. Now, all of you have had a chance, as part of your online reading phase, to read a much better interpretation of Genesis and Thomistic evolution. I think you did read those sections, right, for the program. So that's not going to be the main focus of my presentation. What I want to do is I want to consider how sacred tradition, as embodied in the church's professions of faith throughout the centuries, teaches us to understand the divinely revealed truth that God is the creator of all things, visible and invisible, and how to distinguish that from and relate it to the picture that Steve shared with us of scientific cosmology, but in more depth. As I do, I'm going to refer back to the Jatravartid cosmology often and to show how it embodies the polar opposite of the Christian doctrine of creation. My entire presentation should be understood as a point-by-point -point polemic against the Jatravartid creation narrative. <laughs> now, yeah, you came all the way to South Bend to listen to some guy argue with a sci-fi book he liked when he was 16 years old. <laughs> but actually, that's not the case. Because the Jatravartid narrative shares important commonalities with the caricature of the Christian doctrine of creation espoused by the new atheists. Douglas Adams was an outspoken atheist. Uh, Richard Dawkins gave the eulogy at his funeral. The Jatravartid theology is what the new atheists think we believe. So let me begin by summarizing with reference to the Jatravartid sneezeology. Uh, the Christian doctrine of creation. So there are four elements that I'm going to point to. I'm not going to say this is an exhaustive list, but I think these are the most essential. The Jatravartids saw creation as something coming into being from some greater being. The great green arkel seizure, right? Suffering from a divine bout of flu. But Christians see creation as ex nihilo, literally from no thing. And above all, they do not see God as a greater being or a supreme being, but as the source of being to all things. The Jatravartid saw creation as a process, something with a beginning, a middle, and an end. Right? Achoo! 
But Christians see creation as an eternal act, one that brings time itself into existence, along with all beings, and affects every moment of time. The Jatravartid saw creation as an accidental, unintentional, reflexive act, right? A sneeze. Christians see no necessity on the part of God to create. Creation is free, ex libertate, out of the perfect freedom of God. And finally, and most tragically, the Jatravartid saw creation as a solitary process. A sneeze is something covered up, something that causes us to apologize, you know, like, pardon me for ruining your shirt, to turn away from others. By the way, I almost forgot to mention that this is going to be interactive, and those of you in the front will, will get wet. Sorry, Amy. <laughs> Amy's a colleague. <laughs> but Christians believe creation to be not a solitary process, but from the Trinity, creation ex trinitate, the overflow of perfect self-giving love and togetherness. I will claim that it is something like an act of mercy that causes us and all things to be, although to understand why, I'll take a little bit more explanation. So the Christian doctrine of creation then involves four component truth statements, that God creates the universe from nothing, with time, freely, and as trinity. None of these are the products of human discovery. These elements of the Christian doctrine of creation, which is revealed truth, have been solemnly professed and defined by the Catholic Church at at least three ecumenical councils. The Fourth Lateran Council in 1215, the Council of Florence, or Ferrara Florence, and Basel in 1442, and the First Vatican Council in 1869 to 1870. Um, when we get to the teacher resource sharing website, I'll actually put those statements up for you in a handout, right, that will have also all of my quotes. So don't feel like you have to scribble everything down that I share. Um, not that you would. But anyway, um, so the four elements that we're talking about here, creation out of nothing, creation with time or cum tempore, creation cum libertate or freely, and creation ex trinitate. These are integral to the Christian faith, divinely revealed truths, right? So what I want to do is look at each element to theologically complete the philosophical understanding that Steve shared with you earlier. So we'll move on to the first. Uh, creation ex nihilo. So as I mentioned just a second ago, the Jatravartid cosmology is one in which lesser beings come from some greater being, right? But foundational to the Christian doctrine of creation is that God is beyond the ordinary meaning of the term being. And so is misunderstood when we try to understand him as a being, as a supreme being. Rather, God is the source of being. He is the giver of reality to all things. Beings can be comprehended. And as St. Bernard of Clairvaux once said, see comprehendis non est deus. If you comprehend it, it is not God. My favorite example of the humility involved in this Christian understanding of God is in a fictional dialogue written in 1444 by the philosopher and theologian, Bishop and Cardinal Nicholas of Cusa. He called his dialogue, On the Hidden God, De Deo Abscondito. In it, a pagan approaches a Christian whom he finds at prayer. And when the pagan asks the Christian to identify the God he worships, he receives a startling answer. So this is how it begins. The pagan spoke. I see that you have most devoutly prostrated yourself and are shedding tears of love, not hypocritical tears, but heartfelt ones. Who are you, I ask? I am a Christian. What are you worshiping? God. Who is this God whom you worship? I don't know. How is it that you worship so seriously that of which you have no knowledge? Because I am without knowledge of him, I worship him. In other words, only a God who cannot be comprehended, who cannot be fully known, who is inexpressible truth, who is ineffable mystery, could be the true God and worthy of our adoration. If we could comprehend him, he would be less than us. 
And so this, I think, is a good way to begin to think about this first component of the Christian doctrine of creation. Creation ex nihilo is not susceptible to comprehension, right? It's misunderstood precisely when we try to comprehend it, when we try to fit it into our tiny minds. In one of the two essays in the online reading phase, I made a rather sharp distinction between how and why questions and answers. Do you remember that? One that I think gave some people some pause, like I was saying, theology has nothing to say about right, the whole picture. I wasn't trying to separate reality into two compartments and say theology talks about this and science talks about that. Right? The reason for this distinction is the Christian doctrine of creation from nothing. God uses no pre-existing material to create the universe. So no how explanations are possible to describe the act of creation. His act of creation causes matter, space, time, the very laws which govern the universe to exist. And without this act of creation, there would literally be no thing, no space, no time whatsoever. God, in one divine action from all eternity, creates and sustains all that exists in its existence and its nature, regardless of whether it was the cosmic explosion of the Big Bang, the celestial formation of billions of galaxies that are flying through space, the evolution of planetary life, the formation of the Earth's majestic mountain ranges, you name it. Time and space are not determinative factors when it comes to the divine activity of creation out of nothing. For, as scripture says, a thousand years in thy sight are but as yesterday when it is past for God. No one captured this mystery more beautiful than, for, uh, to me than G.K. Chesterton in a work that we've already mentioned today in reference to Karen's conversion, which is orthodoxy. He says this <clears throat> about creation out of nothing. A child kicks his legs rhythmically through excess, not absence, of life. So he's going to compare God to a child. Because children, now I'm a father of four, three of them are sons, so all of this is going to sound eerily reminiscent of many experiences. Because children have abounding vitality, because they are in spirit fierce and free, therefore they want things repeated and unchanged. They always say, do it again, do it again, do it again. And the grown-up person does it again until he is nearly dead. <laughs> For grown-up people are not strong enough to exalt in monotony. But perhaps God is strong enough to exalt in monotony. It is possible that God says every morning, do it again to the sun, and every evening, do it again to the moon. It may not be automatic necessity that makes all daisies alike. It may be that God makes every daisy separately, but has never gotten tired of making them. It may be that he has the eternal appetite of infancy, for we have sinned and grown old, and our father is younger than we. Now, that's poetic, of course, poetic imagery, but it's true. With unlimited divine youthfulness and energy, God creates every day, day, daisy, causes every sunrise, because God is causing all things to be through his perfect eternal act of creation. In the words of the letter, letter to the Hebrews, by faith we understand that the worlds were prepared by the word of God so that what is seen was made from things that are not visible. Right? We might be tempted to ask again, how does God cause creatures to exist in the universe to be real? That's dead-end thinking. How answers involve processes that occur in time and can be studied, among other fields, by science. God is eternal and unchanging. Time is something he creates. His reality is a perfect now with no past or future. In his perfect eternity, God wills his creatures to be, and because he does so, they are. And so there is no process involved in divine creation. As St. Thomas Aquinas says in the Summa Theologiae, God is the cause hidden from every human being. Now, the doctrine of creation ex nihilo is perfectly hospitable to science precisely because it is not a how explanation. God's creative act is not a change. So it cannot be studied in the way changes are studied. It preserves scientific explanations and theological explanations from bleeding into or substituting for or competing with each other. 
scientists rightly become upset when believers try to stick God into the processes of the universe as a how explanation. In the second essay I provided for the online reading phase, you were introduced to Richard Lewontin, um, who espoused materialism, a scientist who espoused materialism, precisely in order to avoid allowing the divine foot into the door, right? God sticking himself in. But materialism is not necessary to protect the integrity of the natural world and its processes. In the Christian understanding, God is the cause of the existence, the reality of all things, not an all-powerful magical substitute for natural causes. He answers the ultimate questions. Why does anything exist? Why is the universe orderly and yet open? Not questions like, how did mammals evolve? Or how did the universe develop in the first moments after the Big Bang? Science takes care of those questions. And for Catholics, the more science can explain, the more it shows forth God's majesty as creator. The more his creatures can do, the more God is glorified. On the other hand, we have believers who get upset when atheists, such as the late Christopher Hitchens, reject the existence of God because they assume that science has squeezed God out of the gaps in our knowledge of how the universe works. Thanks to the telescope and the microscope, Hitchens declared, religion, religion no longer offers an explanation of anything important, as if that settles everything. That is a serious problem for the great green arco seizure. It's not a problem for the one true God the God of Christianity. If we truly understand God in St. Thomas's way, we should expect, like the Christian in Nicholas of Cusa's dialogue, not a God of the gaps, who explains this or that natural phenomenon, but who beyond our greatest genius and our wildest dreams is the ultimate reason for the existence of all things, constantly upholding them in being, allowing and enabling them to cause each other in a beautiful, sometimes perplexing, always amazing universe. Any being that could be detected with Hitchens telescope or microscope would be too small, would be too creaturely to be truth and being itself. So let me conclude this section with a summary of the doctrine of creation ex nihilo that was offered by St. John Paul II. He did a series of catechesis on creation right after he finished the Theology of the Body series, which went on for like six years, right? Right after that, he did a series of catechesis on creation. He says, creation therefore means to make from nothing, to call into existence, to form a being from nothing. The second book of Maccabees finally presents it as a production not out of things that existed. And that's chapter 7, verse 28 of Maccabees, of 2 Maccabees. The fathers of the church and theologians further clarified the meaning of the divine action by speaking of creation from nothing. In the act of creation, God is the exclusive and direct principle of the new being to the exclusion of any pre-existing matter. Through this creative power, God is in the creature and the creature is in him. However, this divine eminence in no way diminishes God's transcendence in regard to everything to which he gives existence. Summarized beautifully in the book of Sirach, where he says, at the end, all we can say is, God is the all and yet he is greater than everything he has made. And this last part of the Pope's quote catches something beautiful that sharply distinguishes Christian from Jatravartid theology. Because God forms us from nothing and holds us in existence at every moment, he is in us, within us, more present to us than we are to ourselves, as St. Augustine says. A sneeze expels what it produces outwards and away from its source. God is close, even though he utterly transcends his creation. As an unknown Jesuit once said in a eulogy for St. Ignatius of Loyola, not to be encompassed by the greatest, but to allow oneself to be encompassed by the smallest. That is divine. OK, moving on. The Jatravartid theologians look back to gratefully to a moment where, thanks to blind luck, the universe came into existence in the great green arcal seizures uh, uh, in whose snot they live and move and have their being. Richard Dawkins, like the young Chris Baglow, thought or thinks that the Christian doctrine of creation is also the story of a temporal event, a moment in time. 
He says, the Genesis story is just one that happened to have been adopted by one particular tribe of Middle Eastern herders. It has no more special status than the belief of a particular West African tribe that the world was created from the excrement of ants. Well, if the world was created from the excrement of ants, then it happened some time ago when the ants went to the bathroom. In a sense, the temporal language of our creation accounts, the in the beginnings that we see, for instance, at the beginning of Genesis and also the beginning of the Gospel of John, may be, be misleading him somewhat here. Steve made a great distinction for us. The in the beginning refers to the divinely revealed truth that there is a first moment in time. But it does not say, and that's when creation happened, began, and stopped. Right? Creation touches every moment. Stephen Hawking shared the same understandable misconception as Dawkins. In 2010, he declared that theology had, has been made irrelevant by physics. And in 2014, in an interview, he explained what he meant. So when people ask me if a god created the universe, I tell them the question itself makes no sense. Time didn't exist before the Big Bang. So there is no time for God to make the universe in. Contra Dawkins and Hawking, the Christian doctrine of creation is very different from any temporal account of the universe coming to be. It has to do not with the first moment in time. It has to do with the very origin of time itself and of God's perfect eternity. The church's doctrine of creation includes the profession that the universe was created cum tempore, or with time. That phrase should be interpreted as identifying every moment as the result of the divine act of creation. As I said earlier, since God is eternal, his creative act is timeless. The term with time has been used by the church and her theologians to emphasize that time only exists in relation to creatures, not to God. It is a feature of the universe and is itself a created reality that simultaneously accompanies the creation of physical matter. Creation cum tempore means that every moment is the moment of creation, from the first moment of, its exist of the universe's existence until now. All things are being brought into existence out of nothing by God right now. For God who transcends time to create at the first moment of the universe is no different than what God is doing at this moment. Right now, as much as at any time in the past, God is saying, let there be light. Let the earth teem with living things. In other words, God's act of creation is not a historical event that happens within time, but it is a metaphysical reality. It is the dependence, right, the relation of all things to him as creator. Describing the universe's dependence upon God's eternal act of creating. I think Steve mentioned this, but it bears repeating. Did he give you the playwright analogy? I had to step out at a certain point. Okay. The opening lines of Shakespeare's Romeo and Juliet are, two households, both alike in dignity, in fair Verona, where we lay our scene, from ancient grudge break to new mutiny, where civil blood makes civil hands unclean. Those are the beginning lines of Romeo and Juliet. It references a point in time when the play begins in Shakespeare's fictional Verona. That's the beginning. But Shakespeare is the origin of those lines and everything else in Romeo and Juliet. When sacred scripture speaks of God acting in the beginning or before the foundation of the world, using temporal language, we should understand that not as a literal description, but one in which the truth has to be communicated to temporal creatures in temporal terms, right? Beckoning us beyond it to mystery. It's the poverty of human language, which does not allow us to speak in eternal terms, because even the very act of speaking for human beings is a temporal one. Right? So it's pointing, when we see in the beginning in Genesis, or in the beginning was the word in John, it's pointing to God as the origin of the universe, end of history, not to some moment in the past. So you can think about some of those things and ask yourself, sometimes it's, it's helpful to do this, what would it be like if every time you read some reference to God as creator in scripture and heard the words beginning or before the foundation of the world, etc., you thought about that metaphysically instead of temporally and linearly, right? God is in the origin, right? 
that is in God, in God's plan of creation, is a helpful way, I think, to think about this and also help our students understand it. Now, as Steve said, it's true that divine revelation points to a first moment for our universe. That's a truth that's very important for us, but not for scientific reasons. It's important because it tells us that the universe we live in is subject to a narrative, although we don't know all the details of that narrative. Just like salvation history, the universe has a purpose toward which it has been moving in fits and starts since whenever it began. And so the story of our salvation, salvation history, is to that longer narrative the decisive turning point, the chapter which reveals what the whole story of the universe's history is all about. Thankfully, we do not await the coming of the great white handkerchief, but a new heavens and a new earth in which all things will be conformed to the glory of Christ's resurrection and in which God will be all in all. Okay, let's move back to the Jatravartids here. Talk about creation cum libertate. The Jatravartids await a free act by which their universe will be, get, wait for it, wiped out. Get it? Yeah, okay, anyway. But to their thinking, the origin of the universe is an accident. Their universe is an accident. It's not something willed. It's not the result of freedom. Once again, they depart from the Christian profession of faith, which is that the universe is freely created by God. It is something willed and desired. Pope Benedict XVI was getting at this when in his inaugural homily of his papacy, he declared, we are not some casual and meaningless product of evolution. Each of us is the result of a thought of God. Each of us is willed. Each of us is loved. Each of us is necessary. Have you ever met a Catholic creationist who's referenced this as his rejection of evolution? I have. I've, I've actually met many, right? So before we, 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 we don't catch his meaning, <clears throat> two years and a few months after his inauguration, he also said, there is a great deal of scientific proof in favor of evolution, which appears as a reality which we must see, and that enriches our knowledge of life and the universe as such. In other words, he's not denying evolution. He's denying that we are casual and meaningless products of it, not that we're products of it that ultimately we are a cosmic accident. Okay? The Pope is obviously referring indirectly and implicitly to the first creation account, where we see God very deliberately making humanity. Let us make humankind in our image, according to our likeness. The only place where God mulls anything over in the first creation account. Interestingly enough, God deliberates when he's about to make the one creature that we know of that can deliberate. Right? Um, and this points to divine freedom, that God freely chooses to create humans and the entire universe. In the words of Psalm 135, verses 6 through 7, whatever the Lord pleases, he does, in heaven and on earth, in the seas and all deeps. I want to reflect a little bit on the implications of this, on what it tells us. First of all, obviously, it means that God is free to either create the cosmos or not create it. God is in no way perfected by his decision, his eternal act of creation, right, to cause us. It also means that God is not obligated to create the best possible universe. That's a trickier one. God is not forced to create one possible universe out of all possible universes because it is best. This shows God's radical difference from us. As creatures with a capacity to develop towards perfection, we always have a tendency to choose the best, and choosing the best is always preferable and sometimes morally necessary. But God is not perfected through creating. God is already perfect goodness. And the idea of the best universe is always deceptive. Right? What does that mean? Think about it. No matter what existed, a better universe could always be imagined. And any estimation of what the best universe would be is limited by our own finite personal viewpoint. In short, we're part of the universe, and a part cannot know the whole well enough to make that kind of a judgment. The important distinction to make here is between the act of creation and the product of that act, which is the universe and all things, including human beings and angels. 
The act of creation is perfect because it is divine. But the object resulting from the act of creation, insofar as it is finite, is necessarily imperfect. So the universe is imperfect, but it corresponds perfectly to what God freely willed to create. Now, if you don't think I'm doing God justice yet, we have to remember that God has pledged himself to bringing his creation to the fullest possible perfection. In the words of the Catechism, and this is number, um, I don't have the number, sorry. But I'll get it to you later. With infinite power, God could always create something better. But with infinite wisdom and goodness, God freely willed to create a world in a state of journeying towards its ultimate perfection. And in God's plan, this process of becoming involves the appearance of certain beings and the disappearance of others, the existence of the more perfect alongside the less perfect, both constructive and destructive forces of nature. With physical good, there exists also physical evil, as long as creation has not reached perfection. The perfect freedom by which God creates also means that the universe was created out of perfect love. God, who is love, chose to make this universe, and he did so without being under any coercion or divine necessity, which means that God did not have to create in order to be God. The International Theological Commission, the Pope's theological think tank, in 2004 emphasized the personal nature of this free choice of God to create, who makes the whole universe for humanity. It says, the doctrine of creation teaches us that the existing universe is the setting for a radically personal drama in which the triune creator calls out of nothingness those to whom he then calls out in love. There's a beautiful way of thinking about the universe, right? He freely calls it into existence so he can freely call out to his creatures in love. Tomorrow, I'm going to relate this to the problem of evil more fully. But as a preview of that, I want to share with you something from Joseph Ratzinger, this time not as Benedict XVI, but as a 40-year-old priest and theologian from his masterpiece of the late 1960s, Introduction to Christianity. He says... <clears throat> But if the logos of all being, the being that upholds and encompasses everything, is consciousness, freedom, and love, then it follows automatically that the supreme factor in the world is not cosmic necessity, but freedom. The implications of this are very extensive. For this leads to the conclusion that freedom is evidently the necessary structure of the world. Incalculability is an implication of freedom. The world can never be completely reduced to mathematical logic. With the boldness and greatness of a world defined by the structure of freedom, there comes also the somber mystery of the demonic, which emerges from it to meet us. A world created and willed on the risk of freedom and love is no longer just mathematics. As the arena of love, it is also the playground of freedom and also incurs the risk of evil. It accepts the mystery of darkness for the sake of the greater light constituted by freedom and love. If the world is the product of freedom, creation cum libertate, does it not make sense that it freely develops, that its development ultimately produces creatures capable of the exercise of freedom? And if so, does that not also mean that God is never coercive? He never forces creation into a rigid program with no stain, no tinge, no possibility of tragedy or suffering. If God is free, he not only made the universe freely, he made it, as Radzinger says, the arena of freedom. And that makes love possible. And that also makes horrifying evil possible. We're going to get back to that, like I said, tomorrow. Divine freedom finds its most powerful realization in self-giving sacrificial love. The greatest acts of freedom are those by which we love others. No greater love hath a man than to lay down his life for his friends. This brings us to our final element, which is the most important, the one that understood contains all of the other three that I've discussed. It's creation ex trinitate. 
For the Jatravartids, a solitary being, obviously more complex and grander than themselves, <clears throat> gave rise to them and to their universe. To understand how different the Christian doctrine of creation is, consider the words of the 14th century Dominican preacher, Meister Eckhart. Do you want to know, he says, what goes on in the core of the Trinity? I will tell you. In the core of the Trinity, the Father laughs and gives birth to the Son. The Son laughs back at the Father and gives birth to the Spirit. The whole Trinity laughs and gives birth to us. Laughter is not a solitary reality. It is a communal one, one of shared life and perspective and joy. In the first essay I contributed to the online reading phase, I related the universe's order and openness that we see through science to the work of two divine persons, right? The order we see, I related to, anyone remember? Oh, wow, it was that memorable. <laughs> to the sun, right? And the openness we see to the spirit. The sun, the logos, is the mind or reason to whom we attribute the orderliness of the universe. The Holy Spirit, the gift love of God, is the one we, to whom we attribute its openness. Karen talked about emergence, right? To the Father who eternally begets the Son and from whom uh, with the Son the Spirit eternally proceeds. To the Father is attributed the very power by which the universe exists. It should be noted that though we attribute these various actions to one of each of the three persons, creation is an act of the entire Trinity together. The Holy Trinity is a perfect communion of love, which means that the universe is the product of divine love and goodness. In this regard, St. Thomas Aquinas, I wrote my doctoral dissertation on this text, his commentary on Paul's epistle to the Ephesians. St. Thomas offers a distinction there, kind of as an offhand thing, but captured me more than anything else I wrote about that is very helpful in capturing the weight of this. He teaches that there are two kinds of love, at least. The love that is justice, or that is caused by justice, and the love that is mercy, or that springs from mercy. As we consider this quote, ask yourself which kind of love fits with the idea of creation that we, as we've discussed it so far. When a person's love is caused by the goodness of the one he loves, then that person loves out of justice, it is just that he love such a person. When, however, love causes goodness in the beloved, then it is a love springing from mercy. The love with which God loves us produces goodness in us. Hence, mercy is the root of divine love. This is a comment on the second, uh, in the first or second verse of the second chapter of Ephesians, where St. Paul says, uh, because we were dead in our sins, right? God drew us together and basically brought us to life together in Christ, right? So this is what he's commenting on. So I wanted to explore the distinction, and then I'll get back to the question I asked you. Just be thinking about it. Justice is the giving to another what is due to him or her. When I love and respect a great person like Mother Teresa, I am not being merciful to her. I'm being just. Her goodness causes my love, right? It's due her. When I give my children my time and attention, am I being merciful to them? Not in this definition. I'm giving them what's their due, right? I may think I'm being merciful, but I'm not. They are owed that because of their goodness and because they need the love of a parent, right? These things are love but they're loving out of justice because love is what is due. Those who receive love in these cases have a right to it. But what about when I forgive an offense committed against me, when I'm friendly to a person who has hurt me? What about when I refuse to retaliate with injury or, ins uh, or insult and instead offer a kind word? Or what about when I give freely to the poor, helping someone to have a better life? That is a love that isn't caused by a goodness present right, which is the love which occurs out of justice. Instead, this love causes goodness where it is absent. It's a love springing from mercy. Which of those resonates more with the doctrine of creation? 
How is that? The second one. Why? Why, why does the second one? Huh. Well, we're good. Well, we, we, we're good, but is, is nothing good? Does nothing have any hold or have any right or any due? If God creates us out of nothing, then he causes goodness where goodness is absent. Right? Holding us in existence right now, whether we're the greatest saint on earth or Chris Baglow, okay, that, that is an act something like a mercy, Right? the root of divine love. God creates the universe ex nihilo, out of nothing. He causes good things to exist, not out of any justice to them. So divine mercy, the root of divine love, is the reason for the universe and everything in it. We are created out of mercy, in which God causes goodness where goodness is absent. The great English mystic Julian of Norwich, if it wasn't her name, we don't know what her name was. Right? portrays this beautifully in a vision she was given in prayer. She says in the revelations of divine love, the Holy Spirit showed me a little thing the size of a hazelnut lying in the palm of my hand. And to my understanding, it was as round as any ball. I looked upon it and thought, what may this be? And I was answered, it is everything that exists. I marveled at how it could endure, for I thought it would certainly fall into nothingness because of its littleness. And I was answered, it lasts and always shall, because God loves it. And all things have being through the love of God. It's here that we have arrived at the cart of the Christian doctrine of creation. Nothing is unless it is created, and everything created ex exists because of God's inexhaustible, merciful love, because of the laughter, the joy of the Trinity. God had no need to create, he had no hunger to fulfill by creating. The universe is the product of love overflowing. And merciful love is therefore the foundation and deepest meaning of all beings, of all that exists. Creation, um, sorry, merciful love, which is the same mercy with which the world is redeemed by Christ on the cross. So creation and redemption spring from the same source. And the cross of Christ is the very meaning of the whole universe the key to why it exists and how to find our own meaning and purpose in this universe. Back in November, I was invited to speak to the USCCB committee on a catechesis and evangelization regarding science and the rise of unbelief among Catholic young people. Telling you a little bit about my own high school experience might help you understand why I thought and prayed a lot about that when I was asked. I was specifically asked if I would identify five science and religion questions that most bother people, the ones that I get asked the most often. But the more I thought and prayed in preparation, the more I felt my mind drawn more forcefully to the questions people never ask me, but that I wish they would. The most important question I never get asked, especially when I speak to young people, is the one we've been contemplating today. Here's how I told them about it, which is a good summary, I think, of what I've said so far. I said, I never get asked what I mean when I call God creator. Both skeptics and believers seem to assume that for God to create is half about infinite power, half about some kind of occult engineering. This is why so many believers get excited about God of the gaps arguments like intelligent design theory, making God a how explanation for natural phenomenon that they think science cannot explain. They conceive of God as something of a hybrid who is part magician, part mechanic, and part micromanager of complex processes. The idea that a better analogy for God would be a playwright or a poet, and that love is the driving force behind the universe, both in terms of its reason for being as well as its meaning, never enters their minds. This means that in many cases, believers have two ideas about God in their minds. The God they encounter in Jesus Christ, and the God who creates the universe as a kind of feat. To show them the true Christian doctrine of creation is to show them that just as God causes us to come to life in Christ through mercy, causing goodness in us precisely where we have carved holes of nothingness into our lives through sin, 
that the doctrine of creation out of nothing means that every moment is an overwhelming display of the same kind of love. Creation itself is an act of mercy, of God causing goodness where it has no claim, where it is absent. The freedom that we find in the natural development of the universe and of its living creatures is something we should expect if we see it in the light of Christ. This is what I wish someone had explained to the young Chris Baglow, who, like the old Chris Baglow, loves the humor of Douglas Adams, but who, unlike the young Chris Baglow, now knows what the real punchline is. The Jatravartid theology of creation is funny not because it is like the Christian doctrine of creation, but because it is so unlike it, because it is its polar opposite. The great green archal seizure of Adams bears no resemblance to the God of Jesus Christ. In my next presentation, we're going to talk about the problem of evil, which may have already crossed your minds as we've discussed things today. But now I'll stop and open it to your questions. So thank you. Hi. Hey. Um, I am not the best godparent in the world. And, um, Neither am I. I have, I have more than I can count. <laughs> and I have uh, one godson who is the son of friends of mine from college, who um, one is um, an atheist, I guess is, is the best way to put it, or to be more specific, um, is more of an AA um, believer. So he's, he is in Alcoholics Anonymous and yeah. Narcotics Anonymous. And yeah. so his, um, his pain really prevents him from seeing uh, much further than those 12 steps about God. Um, and his, my, my friend who's my godson's mother is um, a Catholic who has also suffered loss in her life. Um, they they um, have not raised their children in the faith, although they have baptized them. Mm -hmm. And in my very few conversations with my godson on a on a one on one basis, um, I came to realize that because we have that God shaped hole, um, he, like all of us, is looking for answers. And those answers were never provided to him from a Christian perspective with any great detail, right. um, almost be out of them being offended by by Christianity um, or out of hurt. So when we talked about the world, he used science fiction. And, and the more I listened to him, the more I realized that he had filled that God-shaped hole that that need for wonder and awe with the, the tomes of science fiction and fantasy, mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. which I could also understand because when I was younger, I, I loved these books. Right. So um, can you talk a little bit about that? How do we reach our, our uncatechized youth who have been provided this, this narrative as a- Who have not. As a, well, who've been provided with the parody rather than the true narrative. Mm, goodness, that's a, that's a good question. Well, first of all, just talk about your godson. Um, AA is a, a remarkable program, which will bring him in its very structure. Well, that's his father. Quite, quite, his yeah, yeah, quite close. Oh, his father, OK. Quite close to what we believe about God, right? Including, including the idea of radical dependence and grace, right? Radical dependence and grace. And, uh, and God is not sentimental. You know what I mean? Um, how to begin would, would be hard to answer because it would probably vary from, any, from, from person to person of the people you described. Uh, of, you know what I mean? Of people who could be described with the same terms you gave me. So I wouldn't want to tell you, here's a formula, because I don't think that there is. Um, I'll say this. Um, I'm going to talk a lot about Pope Benedict and, and Ratzinger, but tomorrow I'll get into more when we talk about the problem of evil. But um, have you, his, his encyclical, God is Love, Deus Caritas Est, he says, Christians know when to speak, and they also know when to remain silent and let love speak. 
He says, the greatest defense of God and man is love. So the first thing I would say is never feel a sense of anxiety that somehow, well, this might be my last chance. This might, okay. God loves him more than we could ever love him, right? right? Rather, show him that love, be an icon of that love in his life and acceptance, right, <clears throat> of where he is. And, um, and, and that, I think, will speak most powerfully and may also give you the chance to speak with words, right? It seems like you're already doing that, but it might be a long, difficult path to follow. Um, St. Monica is a good one to pray for for that, right? Yeah. Thanks. Um, thank you. First, uh, a comment and then a question. And the sure. comment was just that um, I wrote my master's synthesis on the prologue to John. Yeah. So knowing in the beginning versus in the origin would have made that a lot more, would have made that <laughs> helpful. Um, but... Speaking to that, um, is your is your background more systematic or scripture? Systematic? It's systematics, yeah. Do do scholars think there might be any truth to it being a translation issue for in the beginning versus in the yeah. origin? So so I'm thinking about this not simply as to what scripture says, right, or how we could go back to the words in the original Greek or mm -hmm. Hebrew and find out what it meant then and all of those kinds of things, but specifically how because we don't see sacred scripture as the sole source of divine revelation, right? But Jesus Christ is divine revelation, and that revelation is mediated to us through sacred scripture and sacred tradition together as one's thing, right? That it is precisely the way in which the church through her history and her ecumenical councils and that the great theologians, the way that they have expanded our understanding besides what might be a pre-philosophical sort of in the beginning and the words aren't there, right? you know, when Genesis is being written. Um, because yeah. of that more context, that contextual understanding of scripture as right, opposed right. to a literal. Right. In other words, the context within which to interpret scripture is the very life and consciousness of the church, which is the body of Christ in whom the spirit animates. And so I'm thinking about it that way. So the exegetes are right to, to, to wonder about and investigate and, you know, and they could probably say, well, you know, it's really a temporal word that's being used here. I think that's right. And that's why I said, even in those temporal words, for the proper Catholic understanding, we need to think bigger than that, right? We need to begin to think more metaphysically. Sure. Thanks. Sure. I just uh, want to go back at sort of a question <clears throat> slash thought on your um, differentiating the love of mercy and uh, love of goodness in terms oh, the of justice. Mm -hmm. yeah, yeah. Sorry, love of justice in terms of social justice and morality, kind of applying this to my students and kind of bringing it back to them. Um, I've noticed a real struggle in that, in the students finding goodness in themselves and in others, mm -hmm. and the sense that, uh, uh, you know, culturally, like, you know, my body, my choice from any moral stance sure. tends to be there. Uh, so I, I guess I struggle with if we are approaching creation as a love of mercy versus of a goodness, how then can we also communicate Justice. to them? Just, sorry, yeah. Love, uh, yeah. I keep saying it, um, yeah. but the 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 love of the other person because they are creation, yeah. not because of something or my relationship to them. Yes. Well, I think that that's something that the doctrine of creation can help us begin to contemplate, right? right? Um, that, um, and it's something I'm going to talk about when I talk about faith, science, and human origins on Thursday. It's something I'm going to talk about when I talk about what it means to be human. Um, but if God is love and we're the image of God, right, then it's precisely in imitating what we see in both creation and redemption that we realize our humanity and um, that, we, that we really find out who we are. Right? It's not just simply giving to others what is due to them, but it's precisely going beyond that and giving to them more. Right? Um, high school kids have a lot to forgive, and so maybe if you start there teaching them what it means to forgive someone who's hurt them, right? Truly forgive them. I'm not saying pardon them. I mean, not deny the evil that has been done, <coughs> but learn how to somehow love in the face of it, to make love the rebellion against the evil, right? Yeah. Deacon in. Uh, next row, right, straight up, and then here you go. It's right over your shoulder. Here you go, Linda. 
I, I think that was an excellent question, and your response, I like that a lot. I think, this is just a, an observation, I think, that our kids in high school, I think, really get the understanding of justice mm -hmm. and what they are to do with that justice, mm -hmm. um, volunteering and those kinds of things. I, it just, uh, my observation is, I'm not sure that we really correlate that with the love of God. And, yeah. and I think maybe that's the disconnect, where they, they feel pretty good about what they've done, so they feel pretty good about it. Yeah. Other people feel good about it, but I'm not sure we theologize that. Yeah, yeah. Hmm. A good observation, I think. I'm not, yeah. Um, I'm going to try to formulate this question. This has um, kind of been bothering me at kind of a foundational level. Um, like you're, you're, you're showing this doctrine of creation from, from the standpoint of revelation, yeah. right? Mm -hmm. And it's philosophically like, like completely sound. Yeah. Um, okay, good. good. <laughs> I mean, I'm not judging you. I'm saying <laughs> she has a PhD in philosophy, so well, I was you know. waving. The philosophers um, always come in and mess up the party. It's like, man, I was rolling. Well, I'm gonna mess up the party because I feel oh, like oh no, no, because I, I, no, I feel like a lot of my students like try to mess up the party. Like, okay, they, good. Because yeah, like yeah. they, I guess it's just like this concept of revelation in itself. Like we're saying that this is so beautiful. Like look at this. This makes total mm -hmm. sense. But the whole idea of like, okay, prove it. Like it's revelation. Like it's just what you believe. Like yeah, you know. Um, and I just I I never really know where to go with that. Yeah. Um, because science, like even though they may not understand like exactly how science proves or disproves things, like they yeah. know that there is some kind of verifiable method, and um, like you know, philosophy has its own method as well, right. as does theology. Right. But I guess, I don't know, have you had any success in trying to do that? Yes, like, and, and, um, and actually it was very important because I taught fundamental theology every year, at least once a year from 2002 to 2017. So, um, and I, I had to talk about what faith was and faith in divine revelation. And I would rely on a very short lecture that Ratzinger gave while, while he was cardinal prefect of the Congregation for the Faith, called, and it's in his book, The Pilgrim Fellowship of Faith. It's about six pages long, and it's called Faith and Theology. And in that, he talks about what, like the content of faith, how the content of faith can be certainty or certain. But he also contrasts that with the way demonstrative science gives us certainty, right? So in science, and I know I'm speaking very generally here, right? You have thinking first, and then Ascent. So you hypothesize. It's very, very important that you purify that from all bias or prejudgment, right? Or else you're going to end up misinterpreting your results. If you think it's going to be this way and you're already committed to that, you're not going to go find out and maybe even find out that you're wrong, then you, you, you know what I mean? But once something has been demonstrated, then you ascend. Right? Then you have the, we talk about the consensus of the scientific community about something like evolution, for instance. In faith, which is more interpersonal, assent has to come first, and then thinking must follow. And they have to walk hand in hand in assent. The assenting needs to continue while the thinking goes on. And I would always use the example of what it means to be married. It, you know, so I'm a stupid male, right? And one thing I learned very, very early on, that it was possible to kind of sort of treat my relationship with my wife as sort of like a formula. Like I could actually get it set up so that I make sure I say this or give this gift or give, you know what I mean? But that in doing that, I was losing my sense of who she was. And I sense I had to be open to like watching Jane Austen movies with like an openness to actually enjoying them or letting her talk to me about the things that she loved, even though they were things I had no interest in, right? And beginning to open myself to understand her in that way. And it was precisely in assenting to who she was that I came to realize, right, 
her identity in a new and deeper way. It was precisely in that. It was precisely when I let go of the formula and said, and let her, and let her open herself to me, right? and lead me into understanding her more deeply, that I came really, and that's how I, you know what I mean? So we talk about, um, we, we, talk, we talk to married couples a lot in New Orleans. We, we were part of, a, we, we shared a, uh, a faith and marriage ministry. And we would talk about creeping separateness in marriage. And how easy it is to let that set in. Where, you know, you can't point to any way in which, you know, you, you, you're kind of sinning against one another, but you're becoming more separate, your lives are becoming more, because you're following the formula, instead of actually learning how to listen, right, learning, a, and that's what faith requires. The knowledge of faith, the knowledge of divine revelation means to trust God and to listen, to assent, but struggling and questioning thought, as Ratzinger says, that's his phrase, will always accompany that, will always follow it, so then you'll, that's where theology comes from, right? And at St. Thomas Aquinas, and he's basically doing a commentary on a part of the De Veritate by Aquinas, so in this little lecture. He says, um, Thomas calls theology taking every thought captive to Christ, St. Paul says, right? In other words, now our struggling and questioning thought, we begin to submit it to the ascent, and in that theological reflection, we come to know God more deeply. It might be a long answer, but I think if you read the, if you read the, the piece, There'll be a lot of ways you could relate it to that question your students have. Oh, wait a second. It's, 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 uh, are we still waiting for Doug and Josh? Or are they coming at 2.15? 3.15, that is. I don't know. I know Amy's coming. Okay, in good. A minute. Okay, well, we'll keep going until Amy gets back or until you don't have any more questions, and then I'll let you, I'll let you stop. Thank you. Um, kind of uniting the thing about mercy and then what you were talking about, about people being uncomfortable with revelation. So, of course, Thomas, when he talks about mercy, talks about pity a lot. Yeah. And I know that when I've taught students, this makes them immensely uncomfortable to think that mercy and pity go together because we have such a negative connotation with pity, right? That right. the idea that we would take pity on someone would, like, draw mercy from us. Um, and the only sort of success I've had is to try to point out like the way in which pity is a sort of passion that draws us to right. a point. And then the question is, it, this usually goes with charity, right? Like, do you write a check just so you don't have to fill pity anymore? Or does pity move you to like uh, entwine your life with this person? But do you think that that starts to be a sort of deeper thread in all of this is um, when we butt up against things that make us uncomfortable, revelation, pity, that a lot of even this talk about creation, which can seem very yeah. abstract, is we're actually trying to figure out ways that we can be uninvolved yeah. while talking about it from far away. Yeah, so Jay introduced me as a recovering Thomist. So um, I would say this. I think that the concept of empathy is much more fruitful than his concept of pity and even better reflects what he has to say about love and mercy, right? And we can rely on, on um, St. Edith Stein, St. Teresa Benedicta of the Cross, as a person who gave us an, I mean, a, a profound insight into what empathy looks like from within experience. So I would say that, right? So there has to be some translation, in a sense, to update these things, but that's not the only place in Aquinas where that would be the case, right? Yeah. So am I allowed to ask it? thing or make it sure okay. go for it Steve. so it, it seems to me maybe this is stealing something you're going to say in a later talk but it seems to me gratitude is is a huge yeah uh issue and and its connection with the christian doctrine of creation because i think my sense is that atheists tend to take a lot for granted mm -hmm. you know? mm -hmm. and and once you realize well once you realize that everything comes from god mm -hmm then you are grateful for not, it's not that God does some special thing like steps in and does miracles or steps in and, you know, like the ID movement and does some spectacular thing. Everything. Yeah. So maybe you could turn that, we should be, turn that around and, and, and maybe for some students anyway, it might help say, do you ever want, you know, ever grateful, you know, boy, it's, it's, it's a wonderful thing there's such a thing as light. Yeah. And there's such, and there's such right. a thing as vision. Right. Just that, that I can look around and see stuff, or that I, that I, that there's sounds, that there's beautiful sounds, and yeah. I can hear them. The gift of hearing, and the gift, of, mm -hmm. just that I can 
walk and move from one place to another and go through all the things in life. If, if I can think, right. and I have awareness, and that there's a world to, to look at, and all these things that we sort of take for granted. And then once you say, well, you know, this is a pretty remarkable thing that there are such, that there's color. Yeah. Not only can we see, but there are these colors. You know, right. it could right. have been a black and white world. And, and, once, and then you say, boy, uh, I should be grateful for all of these blessings that I, am. even if I'm just sitting here, right. uh, there's uh, just amazing things that I'm in a able to do. And, and, to, and then you, it should evoke gratitude in us. And then the natural question is grateful to whom? Right. You know, and then maybe that gets them to thinking about, well, maybe there's someone to whom I should be grateful that's responsible for all of this. Yeah, right. And, and I, I just think that's a huge thing missing from, from the, from well, the yes. atheists. Are, this taking Even when for, they talk you're about You're taking for beauty, granted. They right. take everything yeah. for yeah. granted. Right. They'll talk about beauty. They'll talk about philanthropy. They'll never talk about gratitude. Yeah, and, 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 and aside from the beautiful work right. of art, just that you can see it all, that there's such a thing as right. vision. Yes. Such a thing as light. Yeah. Right. And, and, of course, the Eucharist means thanksgiving. I mean, isn't that the root of yeah, all that's right. of our worship is gratitude? It's gratitude. Anyway, but I think that's where the doctrine of creation has a very practical result. Yeah. Is that once you realize everything comes from God, then you realize how much we should be grateful for. Yeah. I have a 19-year-old daughter, but when I was working on all of this for the first time, and visiting theological concepts and seeing their weight in a way I hadn't, because I hadn't looked at all of this, right, before this way. Um, I have also four sons, but Margaret was little, so she was maybe six or seven years old. And I remember one day I was thinking about primary and secondary causality, actually. You know, the difference between how and why or how and that, and that kind of thing. And it occurred to me that I had been thinking about my daughter, for who I was deeply grateful, in the wrong way. <laughs> Um, I was thinking about it this kind of way. Like, well, her mother and I, we gave her her body, and God gave her her soul. And I was like, no, that, that's not right, right? And I, I mean, if you had said that to me, I probably would have, but it was just, I was reflecting, and I was just kind of un, like unconsciously falling into this pattern. I was like, no, God created Margaret, body and soul. He's creating her right now. And he had the love and goodness to actually allow us to participate in that. And that was exactly the first thing I felt, gratitude. Um, every year since 1998, I've done a three-day silent retreat at the Manresa Retreat House on the Mississippi. Um, I actually was able to get back this year because I told, after this long winter, I told the, 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 our finance manager that I would go insane if I didn't, <laughs> if I didn't go back. And so, but I had a work thing to do down there, so I was able to go anyway. Um, I went down and um, did three days there. But I can remember one of the best retreats I had, the Jesuit retreat director, who was from Wisconsin, but is now at Boston College. Yeah, I saw you guys over there. Um, he's a Midwestern with a real deep kind of Wisconsin accent, if there's that, such a thing. Anyway, um, he, he told us, he said, when you get up in the morning, because before you start to think or anything else, he says, put your hand on your chest or take your pulse. And if your heart is beating, say, Thank you that I exist, Lord. I know that you're on my side today. It's simple, but there's another example of this kind of, and Ignatius spirituality is like suffused with gratitude and this idea that we exist precisely because of God's love. So, yeah, just to, to add. I think that's, is that everybody or is there anybody else? Okay, so why don't we just take a break and then when Amy gets here or when Doug and Josh, whoever gets here first, we'll get started. Right? Sure. How are we doing on time? Oh, thank you.